Very much. Well, you know, it's the middle of December and uh, we're almost into New Year. I was thinking about speaking today on the topic, maybe, uh, you know, when, you, you, when you're in the gang, li- the gang life and the gang style, you know, there's a lot of things that come with it. You know what I mean? There's women, you know, there's money, you know, there's guns, you know, there's liars, manipulators. You got all types of them, you know, and the thing that I wanted to talk about today was, you know, has a lot to do with the drug trade. You know, I'm not gonna put no names out there, any people or where they're at or what kind of drugs, nothing like that, but I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that I haven't used drugs. I've tried every drug you can imagine. You know what I mean? I've tried them, I've slammed, I've drank, I've smoked, snorted, you know, I tried them all and there's only one or two that really stuck around for a while. All the rest went, like marijuana that came and went, you know, cocaine came and went, crystal meth came and went, but the hard one that didn't leave was heroin, you know, and Heroin catches you up so bad that, you know, you hear guys say, oh, they'll sell their own mama for it. I have seen dudes that'll sell anything they have. You know, I ran into people that will give you the title to their car, you know, let you live in their house, you know. One time we ran into this guy, you know, and I remember selling him a 20 on the corner one time. It was in my hood, I was selling it over the dope. This dude came and bought a 20, you know what I mean? And I had never seen him before, but I had heard through the grapevine that the dude had money, you know. So I followed him around the corner to see what he got in, and he got in a pretty nice car. He got in one of those Chrysler 300s, you know, but it was really nice. And I'm thinking, why is this dude only buying a 20 when he's driving a brand new car, you know? But as I got to meet the guy, I found out why, you know what I mean? Who this guy was, was he was the major drug dealer for like three cities around us. And remember, he only came and bought a 20 off me, so I was like, When I found out about him, I was like, why would this guy only come and buy a 20 and not buy a big issue when he has a lot of money? Well, what he was doing was he had his fillers out there. I mean, he had his fillers out there. He wanted to know who were the main ones from the hood, who moved the most dope, who had the most juice, you know what I mean? And this dude, he was pretty good, you know what I mean? He used to come and he bought another 20 the next day. He came again, he started asking about how much was an eight ball, how much was an ounce, you know what I mean? And I didn't give him no numbers at that time because I really didn't trust the guy, you know what I mean? And being in the dope game, you know, you gotta be careful because, you know, some guys will tell you they got a mountain full of dope and all they got is a pocket full. Another fool will tell you he got a pocket full of dope and he's sitting on a mountain. This dude I'm speaking of, you know, I'm friends with him today, you know what I mean? And he still does the same thing. Now, the first thing he told me about, 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 about the drug trade was your clientele, you know what I'm saying? And this dude, he didn't sell to nobody under a certain age. I think it was 35, 40. He sold to nobody under that age. And at first I was like, whoa, wait up. I'm like 32, you know, and the dude don't sell to anybody over 35. Why is he selling to me? Well, I studied the guy, you know what I mean? I did my homework on the dude and I found out that the dude moved a lot of fucking dope. But he never put his business out there. But the one thing he did do was he did a lot of tests, you know, with dope, with money, you know, and as through meeting him, I noticed that he was picking certain people to deal his dope. He had like, he wanted two women and three men. You know, and this dude, he had went, he had did like 15 years in in jail and um, he had buried some shit. He had put it away in the ground in in the backyard of his mother's house. And this dude had been gone for like, I'd say maybe two and a half years. And I had heard about him when I was, when when I met him the first time, when when I sold him that 20, he had got busted like about a year later. But through that year, he used to come and he used to ask a lot of questions. And I was like, man, I used to be very leery of a person who asked a lot of questions. Because either he was a cop, he's either writing some type of book or doing some doc- documentary or doing, writing anything about the hood or he's either trying to you know, get some type of movie, some type of skit, or he's just a nosy motherfucker. And I was behind this dude and I would follow this guy wherever he would go because I wanted to know exactly who this dude was. Now I followed him the first time, he went to this expensive ass hotel he was at. And I watched this dude from the car, me and my homie, we had a G-Ride, we watched this dude with binoculars, we watched this dude for a while, you know? And all he had was women going, women going in and out. And I wanted to know who this fool was. And like I said, today he's one of my best friends, you know? But at that time, I was really, really leery of this guy because he used to come in by dope, then he used to ask questions. And his questions weren't the regular questions. His questions were more or less like, well, how long has that guy been from the hood? Or how long has he been doing it out here? And that right there made me pretty leery of the guy. Now, I thought that the guy was by himself. 
I didn't know that the guy had one of my homies already working for him, one of my homegirls working for him, and he was asking them about me. So I'm out there doing my thing, I'm out there gang banging, and the drug trade, I didn't really want no part of it because I seen a lot of things that drugs do to people. I seen a lot of my older homegirls, they wouldn't even take care of their kids, you know what I mean? They would leave their house all fucking dirty, you know what I mean? The only time they, they would be happy is when they were getting paid on the 1st or the 15th, that's when offer used to come in, you know, those were like the favorite days, you know? And um, he had one of my homegirls that I remember from seeing her from slamming on the corner. I seen her driving an Escalade, a nice ass apartment, and I didn't see nothing in between. So I was wondering, how did my homegirl go from here and get up here? Well, what that dude actually did was he got a hold of my homegirl, he sat her down, and he offered her, do you want this or do you want to stay with this? Well, my homegirl, she, she rised quick because my homegirl was the type of woman that she would do business with you, but if you did it wrong one time, she would never do business with you again. Now she had got this from this guy, this guy I was telling you about. She had got these certain rules that he had because he didn't break them even for himself. Now this dude was about 28 years old and man, he had nice cars. He had a Cadillac, he had a Suburban, you know, he had some nice ass cars. This was after I found out about him. Now the reason I bring this up is because it's the drug trade. Stuff can seem this way, but it's actually the complete opposite. You know, when the dude came at me the first time, he tells me, uh, hey man, how much do you get for an ounce of weed? He started off with weed, so I said, well, right now they're going 50 or $60 at that time. He tells me, what if I give them to you for 25? I was like, $25 an ounce, that's four ounces for every hundred. I'm thinking in my head, wait, there has to be a catch with this, because remember, I'm sharing this with the people that haven't got involved with drugs, and I hope you don't get involved, but if you do get involved, I'm just giving you a few pointers on not who slings it or who is it, no, like, like that. I'm trying to give you pointers on be careful because there's a lot of good times with drugs, but then there's a lot of bad times with drugs. You know, and if you get involved with them, you have to make certain rules in your rule book because you have to keep them there. You know, guys will tell you anything. I've had motherfuckers come on the street and tell me, man, you know what I mean? Uh, look, man, I got this gold ring and this gold chain. And I mean, they look like they were really gold. And I ended up giving like a hundred bucks worth of dope for them. Then when I went to check them out, they were fake. But yet the guy cruised up with him driving, his wife sitting, crying in shotgun seat, his kids in the back seat and some car seats, and they're crying. And dude's telling me he needs help with some money because he has to drive somewhere and take his wife and kids that they're on the streets. And I felt bad for him, but at that moment, my girlfriend that was with me tells me, don't give him shit, he's lying. But from what I was seeing, the dude was telling me what was happening, his old lady was crying, and shaking her head no, and then his kids were in the backseat crying, so I felt for the guy. I ended up giving him like a hundred bucks and some dope, and the fool wasn't hurting at all, at all. You know, that reminds me of like three months ago, I was over here talking to this dude, he was on a bike all tore up, he goes down the street, parks his bike at a tent, takes off that coat, has a nice shirt under, takes off those sweats, nice pants under, oh, a pair of shorts, he had a nice pair of shorts under, took his sweats off, and had some nice shoes, and jumped into a BMW. Now, why I'm saying this is because there's actually people that come over here in downtown, and they'll park their car on one block, put some raggedy clothes on, come to the next corner, get their sling on for maybe five, six hours, and then go back to their car, get in it, and leave. Now, people do this a lot, you know, and people do this a lot, and I've only learned this through the time doing drugs and being around drugs. I've only learned that drugs don't give a fuck how old you are, they don't give a fuck who you are, they don't give a fuck man or woman, child or adult, drugs have no conscience. They have, they'll, they'll, they'll you give it to anybody, Anybody does it. I ran into this guy the other day. He was like about 14 years old. And I ran into him buying heroin. And it struck me hard because you could tell the guy was only 13, 14 years old. And he had rigs on him. He was hitting dude in the neck. And I was like, man, this guy's like 13, 14. Where in the fuck did he learn how to poke somebody in the neck or draw up blood? Where did he learn all this? So lo and behold, I sat down with the guy and this was dude's nephew, the guy that was telling you about in the beginning, the big dude that was doing big things. This was his nephew way at the bottom, slamming heroin, 13, 14 years old. And you know, to these youngsters out there, I give you the solemn advice not to touch it because once you touch it, 
it's very hard to put down. It's not hard to put down because you can just say, I don't want to do it anymore. No, that's not it. Once you do it for so long and it catches a hold of you, it's like, they call it the monkey. He grabs on your back and he's fucking hard to get off. He's hard to get off. Oh, they got programs. They got methadone. They got sober living. They got uh, the other one where they, where, they, uh, where they pick you for a week or so and they bring you all the way down to where you ain't got to take anything anymore. You know, a lot of it is helpful, but a lot of it is a crock of shit. You know, a lot of it, you got people in there, counselors that are telling you what it is to do heroin, and they've never even slammed it. They've never even picked up a dime to get high on. But yet they're telling you how to kick heroin. The only one I would listen to was a person who already used heroin before. You know what I mean? Not nobody who hasn't used it, you know, because those people are more or less textbook smart. They read out of what other people have written down in their experiences, and then those people go off it. I would rather learn from a person that has already been on drugs, has already been strung out, and been to that point where nothing else matters. You know, when you're strung out on heroin, nothing else matters except your next high. Yeah, I'm not saying that guys don't have kids and there's not guys that are functioning in heroin acts because I ran into them where they got their own home, they got a nice job, they got their kids there, they got their wife, but they slam heroin. They're functioning heroin users and I applaud them because it's really, really hard to get a life going and to get a heroin habit at the same time. I'm speaking from experience. I'm not speaking from something I heard or read in a book. No, you know, I've been to the point where I had money, but money wasn't the thing. You can have the money, but if you ain't got the dope, you ain't going nowhere, you know what I mean? And I've been to the point where I've been to the top where, you know, you're high, you know, you're, you're up there slinging big, got a nice car, a nice house, a big old flat screen TV, everything in your home. But then I'm sitting in front of the TV and I'm wondering, why? I'm not supposed to have it like this. I would tell myself that I wasn't supposed to have a screen TV, a nice car, a nice woman, um, a nice bike, whatever I had. I wasn't supposed to have nice things. So I was setting myself up from the beginning because I didn't feel that I could be successful. That's how I felt. I actually felt that I could be successful. So when I did sit in there with my nice ass TV, my nice ass apartment, in the back of my mind, my conscience would tell me I didn't, I wasn't supposed to have it like this. And a lot of us do that, you know what I mean? When you get high on drugs, a lot of times you tell yourself, well, I'm not supposed to have it like this, you know what I mean? And that's kind of a fucked up way of thinking because you stunt your growth no matter what you're going in, whether you're doing less dope, making more money, making less money, uh, cutting down your clientele, whatever it is, you know, uh, in the back of your mind, you always have that in your subconscious that you are not supposed to have it like this. And I told myself that not once, but several times behind drugs. You know, one time I had my own car, I had a nice ass apartment, a nice ass fucking job. And I remember going down the 10 freeway and I was just about to hit like, uh, what was it? I was just about to hit like Martin Luther King or something going to downtown while I was still like there South Central. And I just pulled over to the side of the freeway, turned my car off, turned the radio off and I was just sitting there. And I was asking myself, why was I right here in life I wasn't supposed to be right here in this, in this part of life. I'm not saying I wasn't supposed to be right there with the drug trade or the money. No, I'm talking about me just living comfortable, period. I wasn't supposed to live in that fashion. I wasn't supposed to have those nice things because I guess it was because most of the money came from dealing drugs. So I bought this, but I didn't buy it like my grandfather or my uncle did it with the sweat off their bra and off their back. No, I did it where I just had to stand in the corner and switch money for dope, you know? And I learned that it didn't matter who came and bought the dope from you because I used to sell to a guy that worked at the bank. He was the manager, bank manager, and he used to come and buy crystal meth from me. And he worked for five, seven days a week, but he used to come and buy meth from me. And this dude used to come in a suit, nice ass clothes. And I used to be like, where the fuck does this dude work at? So when I finally seen him, I didn't ask him, I seen him at the bank. He seen me real quick and he got kind of nervous, but I told him, don't trip, I ain't gonna say shit. But then after I seen him at the bank, I seen him outside, you know, down the way, he was buying some dope and I told him, hey, you know, what do you do at that bank, you know? Cause I was interested, dude works at a bank, he's buying dope off me, you know? Of course I'm interested, maybe we can do something, you know? But at the same time, I just wanted to know the caliber of man that this guy was. This dude had education, he had been to college, he was working as a bank manager, had a nice wife, children, but 
he had tasted some of that black dragon, that heroin, and it got the best of him. Now I remember seeing him dwindle away right in front of me. At first he started getting a piece of heroin and just sticking it in his nose. That's all he did. He just stuck a piece in his nose and he just let it drain all day. Then he went from that to squirting it in his nose. Then he went from squirting in his nose, he tried something different. He actually got like a patch. He put the heroin on there, then he would put it on his arm. And he would go jogging, whatever, working out. And he said that the heroin was soaking to his pores. So he went from there. Then the last time I seen him, he was drawing it up in a rig. But when he drew it up in the rig, I noticed that he no longer wore his nice attire. He didn't have his hair cut the right way. He didn't look like he was working in the bank anymore, so I had to ask him, you know, hey, what happened? You don't work in the bank anymore? No, well, he got fired because some money was missing, and they blamed him, you know? And I think he went to jail real quick, and he got out, and I'm looking at this dude from now, from day one, I seen him when he had some nice-ass clothes, a nice-ass job, to the point now where he's about to jump on a bike that's flat. He don't have nice clothes, but yet, this is what heroin did to him. You know what I mean? He thought in the beginning, he told me that it was going to be all fun and games, that he was just going to be able to feel good, feel no pain, never get sick because that's what heroin does. You don't feel pain. You never get a cold or flu. I, I forgot what a cold or flu felt like. When I was getting high on heroin for like three years straight, I never got sick one time. People were all around me sneezing and coughing, and I wouldn't have to wear a mask or I wouldn't have to cover myself. It was just that some way heroin blocked off not just that, but it blocked off getting sick. I mean, I even noticed to the point where I couldn't even walk down the street and walk through a patch of roses. I wouldn't even smell the roses. When everybody else walked through there, you could smell the roses. Heroin blocks off your sort, your smell, your sense of smell. You can still smell something bad or something very strong, but I'm talking about just walking down the street. You know, you got those purple trees that grow and you can smell that that purple smell, you know, you smell it. I used to smell it at my grandmother's house. But the other day, I'm reason I'm bringing this up is because the other day I walked under those trees and I caught a little scent of what I was actually supposed to be taking in and breathing, getting the actual smell. But I read up on it and it states that heroin takes that part of your senses out. Now that's just that one. I'm not saying they don't take anything else away, but these are for the people that haven't used heroin or that are barely starting using it using it. You know, that thing's gonna be around your life for a very, very long time. Let me tell you, I have did it, stopped, did it, stopped. I mean, I stopped completely for five years, didn't even take an aspirin. Not even an aspirin, I wanted no drugs in my body, no aspirin, Tylenol, weed, nothing. And to be honest with you, those five years, I could say were probably the best five years of my life because drugs were not a part of me. You know, I had that nice ass car that I paid the loan every, every, every month. I had that nice three-bedroom apartment by myself. You know what I mean? I had nice clothes. You know, uh, the women, they were still kind of the same, but different friends. You know what I mean? I had different friends. I didn't run with the same crowd. And I didn't think that I was, I was any better. But I noticed at times, if I seen you on the streets and you were getting high, I would just say here and I would leave. I would avoid you. But if you weren't getting high, I would keep you on part of my team. And this is, you know, we had my team, guys that didn't get high. I remember one time my cousin asked me, when I was deep into the game, my cousin asked me, hey man, let me get a part of that action, you know? And I told him, do you, I asked him, do you get high? And he's like, yeah. I said, well then, here, you know, you can't get a part of this action. He threw that in my face like about three years ago. Hey, remember when I asked you if I could work with you and you said if I get high that I had no part of it? I said, yeah, I, I had to apologize because I didn't feel that any, I was any better than anyone that used drugs. I just didn't want anybody around me that used them because I know me. If I seen it and it was the right time, I would do it. And then from that point on, it would just be a roller coaster ride. I, I couldn't just use it and stop, use it and stop. That wasn't me. I had to use it, buy more, use it, buy more, and then sell it to buy more, you know, and that was my thing. And when my cousin threw that in my face, I felt, kind of felt guilty and kind of bad because I was at the same position he was at many times. And I remember when I had asked people the same thing and they shot me down, well, they were shooting me down for the same reason that I shot my cousin down. Just recently, I have a homie that he does skits and he does parts in Hollywood. He works for Suspect Entertainment. 
No, that's his whole hook up there. That's all him. And I'd heard through my other homies that he was getting guys, you know, to do, you know, come out in movies and do different shit. And I thought, man, you know, maybe I could get a piece of that action. Maybe I can, you know, put my face on the screen and, you know, speak to somebody. But when I got in my homie, that was the first question he asked me. That was the first question. He's all, do you get high? And I was going to tell him no, but I wouldn't have been able to hide it in front of him because he doesn't get high himself. He never has. In all the years I've known him, he's been through my, in my hood since I was a kid. He's been a kid. He's never, ever used drugs. That wasn't his thing. But when he asked me that question, if I use drugs, because I asked him about, you know, his movie thing. When he asked me that, I was going to lie to him and tell him, nah, I don't fuck around. But it would have been too hard because... He would have found out I was fucking around then. I would have been deep in, this, deep in a spot with him. And he's the type of individual that you don't want to get in no kind of situation with. He's just that type of motherfucker. Now, when he asked me that, I told him, yeah, I get high. He said, well, let me know when you don't get high anymore and you could come work for me. Now, I've seen his skits. I've seen parts on, on, on music videos that he's did. You know, and he's pretty good. You know, I also seen him speak for 30 minutes on Eyewitness News. They had this kind of half an hour special and he was on there. I also seen this little uh, like movie he did on YouTube and he's pretty good, you know what I mean? I, I like his stuff and I would never hate on my homie. But the only thing is that if you get high, you can't be no part of him. And it's kind of hard for me to believe that every individual I see on that screen with him, they all don't get high. That, that's just hard for me to believe, but to each his own, you know? And that's a part of the drug game that if you're getting high, if I wouldn't have been getting high, I probably would have had action with him. I probably would have been making big money, but yet I chose to get high. Because in the beginning, when I first started getting high, oh, it was fun. Prison was fun, jail was fun, everything was fun. But now that I got older, a lot of it's a crock of shit. I mean, I go to jail now and I don't see one person that I know from jail, not one guy. Before when I used to go to jail, Oh man, I knew everybody in there. I know everybody from the streets, from different parts of jail. I knew all gang of guys in there. Now I go in there and I don't know a soul in there. But I got this 18 year old kid telling me to be quiet. Not in that fashion, but more or less, you know, shut it down, put it on quiet. And that means shut up in other words. And I know the 18 year old kid ain't been nowhere. He got a deep ass voice with a little ass body, but he's that man in that seat and for me to sit back and just allow him to dictate my program when he hasn't even been to a real program. The guy hasn't been to her. Not saying he's a bad guy, but I think always somebody who has a seat of authority should have some type of knowledge of what he's doing. You know what I mean? And I share that with the people that are gonna get involved in drugs because when you get involved in drugs, there's one thing that's gonna come for sure, jail. You know, I find it hard to believe that there's someone out there that could sell a gang of drugs and not get high on them themselves. You know what I mean? It's hard to believe because I've seen every kind of drug dealer imaginable. Dude on the corner, I seen a dude in it, we called it the mini mansion. This fool actually had White House pillars in front of his house. You know what I mean? And this guy was a straight white guy. No tattoos, no hardness to his look. But in reality, he was a stone fucking solid ass motherfucker he didn't take shit from nobody but his appearance threw you off you think oh, i'll rob this guy no he'd be the last motherfucker you want to rob you know what i mean his house was nice i mean he had white house pillars in the front he had a pool table in his den you know this dude had it going on and all he used to do was pick up something from somewhere and drop it out somewhere else he never ever touched anything he never ever lined anything up or sold nah he that's all he did and you know, that type of drug dealer, you know, my grandfather told me one time, do you think you're a drug dealer? You, where's your truck load of dope at? When you roll up with a truck semi full of drugs, then I'll say you're a drug dealer because a real drug dealer has a fucking mansion, has a fucking army with him and has truckloads of dope. A guy that's slinging fifties or hundreds on the street, he's not a dope dealer. He's just what you call a connection. You know, and there's a difference between the, between being the connection and being the main dope dealer. There's a big, big difference. If you want to call yourself a dope dealer and you're balling, well, then you have to drive a semi up full of your dope and then you're balling. I'll actually say you're balling. You know, my little brother used to always ask me when he used to sell dope when we were in the gang and shit, he used to ask me, am I balling, bro? Am I balling? And I used to tell him, nah, nah. And then one time he asked me, hey, am I balling? And I said, look, you'll be balling when I see you turn that corner in a Hummer.
Three months later, I'm in my hood kicking it, and the Hummer turns the corner. And my little brother gets off it, he comes around, and he tells me, what's up, bro? Am I balling? And I told him, yeah, yeah. Now, now, yeah, you, you could say you're balling. You know, he was driving a Hummer, you know, and my brother's only a year younger than me, but he approached it in a different way. You know what I mean? He approaches things in his own fashion. You know, he wants no part of anybody. He don't want to get involved with nobody. It's just him, pay his dues, but he always keeps to himself. You know what I mean? And he's been in jail so many times, been caught with so many guns, but never a clip. And I didn't know that you can get caught with a gun if you don't get caught with the clip. They'll let you out the next day. But if you get caught with the clip, they ain't gonna let you out in a while. I barely found this out, you know, but that was just, you know, asking information, you know what I mean, about different shit, you know, because if your lifestyle is a certain way, my best advice is find out what comes with that type of lifestyle. Because like I said, with drugs only comes heartache and pain, suffering, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're so fucking hooked on it that you want it so bad that you go to desperate measures. You know, you got... With all due respect, you got women out here and men that sell themselves not three blocks away from where I kick it at. And I've always wondered in my mind, I understand how a prostitute does it, but what happens if the ugliest, sickest, smelliest person comes and has a gang of money and wants to sleep with you and you got to sleep with them for that money? I couldn't lower my standards that low and do that and still feel comfortable with myself. And I asked the prostitutes that question before. What happens if this big old fat greasy motherfucker comes with pimples on his back and he wants you to kiss him? And what do you do? Uh, and she told me that you just do what you gotta do. And I was like, I can't understand that. You know what I mean? Because at that point I would say, wait up, man. I'm not fucking putting my hands on this person. I'm not saying anybody, everybody's ugly or everybody's handsome as fuck. I'm just saying there is a certain line that I don't cross in the ugly department. I mean, that's just the way it is, you know what I mean? But when I asked these prostitutes on the streets when I was dealing drugs, that's what they told me, that you just gotta do what you gotta do, you know? And I didn't understand that, you know? Prostitution ain't like selling drugs. You're selling your body, not something you can have in your hand, you know what I mean? And I mean, I'm slang for marijuana, cocaine, heroin, guns, I'm slang it all. And all of it has brought me the same thing. Either I go to prison for more than five more years, or I'm hooked on drugs, really, really fucked up. And don't get me bad, I'm not looking like some hobo or some bum on the streets, but I'm not looking as well up to par. Up to par is what I mean where everything is nice. Your shoes, your pants, your shirt, your hair, everything's combed right, and you're dealing drugs. You know what I mean? But like I said, you know, if you're a real drug dealer, then you have to be a real drug dealer. You can't sit on the corner and move 20s and say you're dealing drugs because of the fact that like I said, I've seen them all. I've had my brothers, my uncles, my sister, my brother. All my family members have been through their little drug thing. You know I me, mean? either they were strung out on drugs or they were moving drugs. And it's sometimes drugs is so fucked up where it doesn't even matter if it's your family member. Even if your family member has the dope and you're hurting and you need some, they're gonna tell you no. My family members have shot me down many a times. Nah, and I'm getting mad like, what the fuck, what do you mean? You're my family member, you're not just gonna leave me sick, are you? Hell yeah, they would, because that drug becomes more important than, any, than anything else. And this is straight for my family members, you know what I mean? And a lot of times I did the opposite and brought my family members in. Wrong thing, wrong thing. You don't want to get involved with drugs and your family at the same time. Because your family member always has that upper hand on you where they're like, well, what about, they mentioned their kids or their old lady, so you get that soft spot for them. But now if you hire your enemy or somebody you don't really like, they're gonna do their job to par because they're trying to prove to you that they can be the same place you're at, you know what I mean? And I learned that through the years of being in the drug trade that you would rather have your enemy sell drugs for you than your closest friend. Cause your closest friend is always gonna have an excuse and your enemy is not gonna look for an excuse because they don't wanna look any weaker in your eyes. And I've had them both, you know what I mean? And I've, and I've seen that before because my homie's dealing for me, I know his wife and everything. And every time he would come short with the money, he would bring his wife up. Now she was sick with cancer, so he'd bring her up. So I had that soft spot for him. But yet I had a dude dealing for me that I had beat up before. He was never late with his money. He never had an excuse. And I used to wonder, why is this motherfucker never fucking up? Well, what it was is he never wanted me, he never wanted me to see him fuck up or for him to ask me for anything because he really didn't like me. But yet that was the guy I wanted to keep close to me. You know, like the guys I fuck with today, I've gotten a fight with them like two or three times. 
They either stab me or I stab them. And they're the closest motherfuckers to me right now. Some people would think, man, that's kind of crazy. But no, the lifestyle that I live, I would rather have a motherfucker that I know would stand up to me and want to fight with me than to have a motherfucker on this side that would bow down to me and give me up when the time came. I would rather have the motherfucker that's in the same spot with me. I know that if we get back to back and we're handling our business that I don't have to turn around and look for this guy because he's right there because he's not gonna let me see him sweat, get beat up or come short. And I learned that in the drug game. You have no friends. Yeah, you might be able to bump a motherfucker. Oh, this is my dog. No, he's not. No, he's not. None of these motherfuckers are your friends. You have no friends in the drug trade. You trust nobody. Sometimes I can merely trust myself doing anything. You know, why, why I speak about the drug game is because with gangs comes drugs. There's never just gangs and no drugs or drugs and no gangs. No, they run hand in hand. Maybe you wanna be that guy that picks up the sack and get your sling on and don't wanna be involved in the gangs. It's impossible because they're gonna come and wanna know where you're dealing on their street. And when they come, you know, they've come a lot of times and asked me when I was younger, hey, we're here doing this, this. I'm just living. I ain't living a, a beyond my means, which means, you know, you're driving a fucking Cadillac living in a shack. No, I'm talking about, they say sometimes, you know, when I used to go approach people and ask them about their drug trade because I was in that seat to ask them. I used to ask them, but already know exactly what they were doing because I want to see what type of person they, they were. You know, if they would come out straight and tell me, look, I'm moving ounces, I can give you, okay, and that was what they were doing. Well, then most of them, I wouldn't even come. I would miss a week with them every month just because they were honest in the beginning. But then you got those other motherfuckers. Oh, I ain't got shit, dog. I ain't got nothing. And they're selling ounces for $500 a whop and they're moving like 15 a day. You know, so, you know, you also run into people in the drug trade like that. They act like they ain't got shit, but they got a whole lot of it. And then, you know, what really strikes me the hardest inside is when people use heroin, you just go to a corner, buy a balloon, put in a, a cooker, cook it and slam it. You don't even know what's in that motherfucking balloon. You don't even know if the dude put poison in there or if it's bad dope and it's gonna kill you. You know, we never ever think of that. I remember so many times I grabbed stuff out of people's hand and went and did it without even checking it with it, without even seeing if it was good or if it was bad, you know. Once you put rat poison in your veins, you're dead. I've run into many, many people and went to their funerals behind them overdosing on fentanyl or overdosing on heroin or just getting a hot shot. But they were so easy to get a hot shot because nine out of 10 people would just grab the dope out of the hand and go fix it without even knowing what the fuck actually is in there. You know what I mean? That it, and it's very, very hard. The drug game is very, very hard. I would rather tell you right now in front of the camera to get a job because of the fact that being in drugs is so hard. It's a fucking hard ass job. First of all, you gotta find the shit. Second of all, you gotta make sure it's not bunk. Third of all, you gotta make sure the dude ain't gonna burn you. Most of all, you're watching for the cops. You know what I mean? Who knows how fucking far you went to pick it up. You might live all the way in Norwalk and go all the way to Pacoima to get it. It took you all day to go up and back, but you wanna be involved in drugs. It's a very, very hard game. It's, it, it's so hard that it just don't take parts of your mind. It also takes parts of your life. You know what I mean? It cost me seven years in prison one time, four years another time. And to tell you the truth, all that getting high didn't sum up to those four years I spent in prison without spending time with my kids or my family. I spent time in prison behind getting caught with a 20 of glass. You know, a 20 of glass, I went and did seven years where dudes were getting caught with three guns and only getting five years. And I was like, today, if you go and you get caught with a 20 of glass, you know what they do? They give you a ticket and let you go right there on the spot. But yet, they gave me seven, and a, seven years of 80% for the same amount of drugs I got caught with, and they pat me on my fucking hand and said, leave. You know, so you got to be careful with the drug game because gangs are going to come with that. And you might not want to get involved with the gang, but once you start selling that first shit on the corner, you're only digging yourself a deeper hole to where these guys are going to come get at you and ask you, hey, what are you doing? How much are you moving? Because you're on their block. They, they might not own it through the government, but yet that's their block because they're on there all night and day. And don't think you're just gonna sling and they're not gonna come and you're gonna get involved. 
I seen many, many, many guys that sold drugs and then I see them down the line and they hit me up asking where I'm from and I'm like, wait the fuck up, I know who this dude is and he's from a gang already. How did he get involved with that gang? Behind the drugs and the money. Not behind him going putting in work because they let motherfuckers in gangs now that just make money, fools that know how to make money. You got dudes out there, I ran into a guy that told me, oh man, you got guys that can kill and you got guys that make money. I'm the type of guy that makes money. Whoa, okay, I ain't fucking with, with that guy because he left the other part out. He ain't no type of mother, good motherfucker, he ain't no killer, he ain't gonna put in no work. He's just gonna make money, so that means when he gets thick, he's gonna give me up, you know what I mean? And you gotta watch that because, you know, they got people out here working for the police that all they do all day long is go buy drugs from people and then tell the police where the drug spot's at. And I ran into those people before. You got homegirls out here that they'll give you oral sex for five fucking dollars. You know, so, you know, and it's, it's somebody's mother, it's somebody's sister, it's somebody's wife. You know what I mean? I ran into girls out here that I'm kicking them, I'm partying with them, and then somebody drives up in a car and he's bawling and everything, and he's talking about, ain't nobody let this girl get hurt because I'll come back and I'm looking at her like, who is she? I knew who he is, but who is she? A minute ago, I was looking at her like a piece of meat. She's just out there, whatever, giving fucking oral sex for what? But little did I know this is this dude's little sister out there. Now he's trying to get her to go home in front of us. She ain't going nowhere. She's stuck. She's stuck on the crystal meth. She ain't going nowhere. She's not going to leave. And I remember when she got there, oh man, she was beautiful, fine as hell. Now she's been there two months and her clothes barely fit her. She's pulling her pants up because she needs a belt. I remember when she was thick as fuck, fine as fuck. Now, now I look at her, I wouldn't even touch her with anybody else's shit, you know what I mean? And, and it's fucked up because that's what I've seen drugs do to people. For being out here for five years, I've seen motherfuckers either go from here to up here. They're living in a tent, and then a year later, they're up there in one of those lofts that cost like $3,000 a month. And they never ever come down again. See, those are the ones that I trip on, the ones that they're right there with you and then they come up and make a step and then they get put up there in one of those lots and you never see them again. You know they're up there because you hear they're up there but they never come down. And I always, I always trip on that because I go over there a lot and I'm like, hey, what happened to so-and-so? He's up there. What about so-and-so? He's up there. What, they never come down? They never ever come down. They stay up there. You forget they're around, you know what I mean? And I just was asking one of my homies recently. I thought he was busted all this time. I thought he was in jail. No, he's been up there in one of those lots and he doesn't move, he doesn't come down and put nothing in your hand. He's up there doing the bigger things, you know what I mean, up there sitting watching all his shit go on. Now if you get that high, hey, more, more power to you. But with being that high comes multiple, multiple problems. Because everybody wants to kick you out that seat or everybody wants to sit in that seat you have. No matter how much dope you move, how many people you had to handle, you're at a certain spot, there's always one or two motherfuckers that want your spot. They want your spot and they're coming to get it no matter what the cost is. Whether it costs them their life or you their life, they want your spot. Now, is it really your spot? I mean, how did you make your spot? You have to look at how long it took, how many people you had to have with you or how many people fell through the way where you got your spot. You have to remember along the way you made a lot of enemies and along the way, a lot of motherfuckers are jealous. They have envy, you know what I mean? They want to see you fall. You know, you can get up to this high and then they got that crab in a bucket scenario. They're just gonna pull you back down. You know, I used to trip because there used to be guys that tell me, oh man, I'm getting out next week, dog. I've been down for five years. As soon as I get out, my homie's gonna put a pound of dope in my hand and a strap. And that's your homeboy? Really ask yourself, is that really your homeboy? He didn't say, hey, homes, here's the keys to an apartment. Here's a car, dog. You know, get a job and help me pay the rent. No, he was, here's a pound, here's a gun, go ahead, go back to jail. Now, is he really your homie? Some guys might think, that's my homie, dog, he looked out tough. Then you got the man on the other side that'll say, wait up, this motherfucker wants to see me go to jail again. Cause it doesn't matter how much dope he's gonna give you, he's giving it to you for a reason. Most of the time he's giving it to you because he knows you're not gonna get burned. You're not gonna get got. So if you don't get burned or you don't get got, that means he's not gonna get burned, he's not gonna get got. You know, you think, oh, I'm the one doing all the work. Yeah, you are. He's just sitting up there collecting the money you're bringing and you're the one doing all the work. You think you're shining? No. In everybody else's eyes, he's shining. You're just helping him keep shining. That's all you're doing. You know, I used to think, man, I'm up here. I'm dealing pretty good. 
but there was always a motherfucker above me. And he was taking all the credit for all the work I was putting in. You know, and you have to remember that. There's always levels to being involved in drugs. You got the user to the dealer, to the, the move mover, to the pusher. You got the fucking food drops it off. You got so many different levels of drug dealing that people only think there's one or two. The guy who buys and the guy who sells. Fuck no, no. There's levels on everything. It's just as you rise higher in dealing drugs, you see what level there is because you're on that level. You just move level by level. Believe me, at any given time, you can drop all the way to the bottom again just for one fucking decision. You know, we make thousands of decisions a day, but it only takes one decision to fuck everything off. You know, and I've known, I've been to where I had 15 motels on Whittier Boulevard, all the way down Whittier Boulevard, 15 motels on both sides of the street. I used to go drop off the dope everywhere and then come back two days later and pick up all the money. And I thought I was doing big things. Hell no. The guy that I was picking it up from and giving the money, now he was doing big things. I was just the one running around taking the chances, what we call prison chances. And you take prison chances with dope all the fucking time. You mean, go ahead and get caught with some acid, see how they break your ass off. Go ahead and get caught with a lot of fentanyl, see how they break you off. When you can go with your ID down the street and buy some marijuana out of a shop for 30, 40 bucks with your ID, this one over here, you gotta buy on the low low, but this one you can buy in front of everybody and walk around with it in a big old plastic broadcasting that you got some marijuana. You know, it's just, it's a real trip because I remember when we used to hide smoking marijuana, the smell and everything. We hide, you know what I mean? Try to blow the smoke away. Now you can go like it's the liquor store and buy marijuana, you know what I mean? But yeah, you got guys sitting in prison doing 10, 15 years for a couple of pounds of marijuana when you got these dudes over here making 10, 15,000 for just pushing the shit out of a dispensary, they call it. You know, and I've had a lot of opportunities, guys tell me, hey, come in, man. Come in, just put your money in and we'll get a dispensary going. I've seen so many dispensaries go down. I've seen dispensaries where they're just there. Guy just gets a place, sets up a gang of weed, and he ain't got no permission to do it, nothing. He's just moving, 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 boom, until they crack him. But everybody in there knows if the cops come, we're busted. But do you want to work for me? Because he's paying a good price, but yet if you get cracked, all that but that's there is going on you. And a lot of guys are willing to take that chance. Me, before I was willing to take that chance when I was younger because jail didn't mean shit. I'll go do it and get right out. But now that I'm a little older, jail means just a little bit more to me now because before it was fun, before you got there and your homies had tobacco and coffee, soups for you and everything, everything you needed. Now you go, they ain't got nothing for you. All they're asking is what you brought for them. The other way was the other way around. When you got to jail, they used to bless you with everything. Shoes, clothes, to eat, to smoke. And it was all good. Now, you can't even ask a guy for a fucking Top Ramen, which is 25 cents out here on the streets. He'll have a problem just giving you that. That's how bad jail has changed. When I went, it used to be all older dudes with big ass whips, tacked up, swole as fuck. Now I go, there's maybe like three or four older dudes and the rest are all youngsters. Shut the fuck out. Dude's trying to tell you, hey man, you need to work out today. And he hasn't even did a push up in the last five months. You know, that's the kind of morale, that's the kind of people you got in jail now. They're, they, don't, they don't go by respect and honor anymore. They go by how much money you got in the streets, how fast you can get money to some of these books. You know, I just share that with you because I wanted to share a little bit about the drug trade. It ain't all what it seems. Before you take that step and want to get involved in this shit, like I tell you all the time, do your homework. First, see what you're really getting involved with. Is it really worth it? Because I'm gonna tell you before anybody else can tell you, you're gonna lose your life, all your loved ones, your respect, your honor, everything goes and gets tied up and thrown to the side. Why? Because drugs is more important. A dude would wanna get his money before he can wanna help you. I just wanted to share that today, you know what? That that's the drug trade, that it, it, it all balls up to Absolutely nothing. It's illegal for one. Number two, when you get caught with it, the closest fools are gonna give you up. The motherfuckers you thought had your back, no, they've been working with the cops all along. So I share that today, man. If you're gonna get involved in drugs, do your homework on it first because you don't really want a part of that shit. I don't, you know? Kumar, 